you know, architects are very good at architecture, but very few of them have any experience in marketing and public relations. Business of Architecture, episode 252. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and I am your guide to discover the tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video that I've prepared especially for podcast listeners by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today, we welcome Ariana Leopard back to the show. Ariana is the Director of Marketing and Public Relations at SB Architects, a firm with offices in Miami, San Francisco, and Shenzhen, China. In today's episode, you'll discover how to create a business development plan that includes strategy as well as tactics, the difference between getting published in the press and true public relations, and how marketing relates to business development. Ariana Leopard, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, I should say welcome back. So catch us up on what you've done since the last time you were here on the show. Well, it's been a few years. Uh, currently, I am the director at SB Architects, and we are a global architecture firm headquartered out of San Francisco, but we have offices in Miami and Shenzhen. And in this role, I oversee all of our strategic business development plans, marketing, and public relations. So tell me, what goes into a strategic business development plan? First and foremost, it's defining your core practice areas. Uh, when I came on board, we sat down and had strategic planning sessions and decided, you know, what do we do and what don't we do? From there, we have began to rethink our multifamily practice, what is mixed use? What differentiates us from our competitors such as CRTKL? Um, what markets do we want to enter? Um, we decided to put a more comprehensive plan together for entering the Asia market. We opened an office in Shenzhen in 2014, but you know it was sort of um, you know touch and go about you know what is China? What should we be working on? What kind of clients? should we go after and what's our core offering and a big part of this is always fee um you know how low do you go uh what you know what makes sense and what doesn't so that's kind of what we've been doing from a business development standpoint and then from there transitions naturally to marketing you know do you create a one-size-fits-all plan or do you have a different core marketing area or practice plan for asia versus latin america versus the middle east so when you talk about going after potential clients, tell me what that looks like. Uh, first, it's doing your homework. Uh, you know, a lot of people, we're not a large firm. We're a mid-sized firm, which makes it uh, challenging in some ways, but there's a lot of opportunity. We don't divide our studios across the globe. All of our work comes from San Francisco or Miami. So, you know, we don't have a studio director running Hong Kong creating Chinese specific collateral or videography or a business development plan. So that said, we need to really define, you know, who's the teams, how do we best operate, how do we service a client um, in China when we're doing all the production work in San Francisco. Um, you know, uh, Chinese, Chinese clients love the fact that they're getting an American architect but we also need to be conscious of the fact that we're working and operating on a different time zone. So how do we accommodate that? And how do we make the fee make sense from our end? How do you find that these contacts are established when you don't have any contacts to start out with? How would, how would you recommend that a firm go about breaking into a new market sector? Well, we do a lot of research on the projects that we'd like to work on. You know, uh, we have a team of, let's just take our mixed use uh, practice. 
And we sit down weekly and review all the new projects we see in the media and what kind of aligns with our interests and our expertise. And from there, we reach out. Um, some of it's cold calls, but you know, it's a, it's a small industry and it's getting smaller and smaller with all the new mergers and acquisitions, especially in the hospitality space with the Starwood mergers. Um, the players are moving around, but they're all under one umbrella. So it's really keeping track of the people that you once knew and where are they now. Um, the developer groups, we see a lot more projects being funded by private equity instead of REITs. Um, we prefer to work with the private sector. So really, it's keeping track of your black book of business and keeping track of the recent mergers and acquisitions, keeping track of market trends and where the money is, and then keeping track of the new projects that align with your core practice areas. Now, an initial phone call to establish, let's say a, co a cold call to establish contact with someone, uh, who, who generally makes that call in the firm? I make a lot of the calls um, and our board of directors makes a lot of the calls. So, you know, we have a couple people who kind of spearhead our mixed use. So it would either be myself or in this case, Mark Sopp. If it's hospitality, you know, a phone call from our president moves the meter a lot more than I think anyone else. But if that's the case, I really like to prepare Scott. Here's the background on the client. Here's the projects that there are in the pipeline and maybe projects that aren't published yet. Again, clients really like to know that you've done your homework on them and not just fish through their website. And then also knowing how all the players connect. Um, you know, you might have a second degree connection with the director of development, um, but, you know, you might want to actually reach out to the managing principal or the CEO of the brand directly. So knowing where all the, who all the players are and where everyone matches up and then previous experience, um, you know, a lot of times people forget to call their architect's background or prior background experience. For example, we just opened up an office in Vietnam. Well, we don't have a history in Vietnam, but we do have architects who do have five or 10 years of experience working in Vietnam. So figuring out who should be in on those initial calls is really important. And what would, that, what would you say during an initial call like that, Ariane, if you were gonna call up someone out of the blue? I start with telling them that I admired their portfolio and their leadership in the, in the industry and, you know, be specific. People don't like cold calls. Everyone likes to buy, but no one likes to be sold. So tell them exactly upfront how you would add value to their portfolio. If there is a mixed use project in, let's say, Texas, Texas is very fruitful right now, but they generally don't hire California based architects. So tell them that you saw X, Y, and Z launched in some kind of PR capacity. And this is, you know, X, Y, and Z from my portfolio that aligns with your interests and exactly how you would add value. So if you notice they're in concepts, but, and they're just going through the entitlements, talk about how you might rethink their master plan and how you might create a more vibrant retail space or how would you, you know, if they're looking at, um, retail anchor developments. Well, we're not, we're in kind of an anchorless world right now. So how might you make a truly mixed use space to create an 18 seven experience for their users? You know, people like problem solvers. So that's how we position ourselves now is we're strategic partners with their clients and we're also problem solvers, not just designers. Okay. Now on that phone call, are you walking them through some potential design solutions or what would you be saying personally, Ariana? That is what I actually do. Um, so I set it up with a qualifier of what is our experience. And then I actually throw out some freebies. You know, I've looked at your master plan online. You know, there's an absence of peekaboo moments. You have a lot of commercial space, let's say, an office space, class A office. But what are you going to do, you know, and all throughout the day, you know, it's only busy in the morning during lunch. And then when people are leaving, but then you have all this dead space in your real estate on the weekend. So why don't we create a park setting? Why don't we integrate some F and B into the scenario? Um, same thing with a hotel, you know, someone may say, well, we want, you know, this amount of convention space. I said, well, that's great. But what happens to all those moments on the off season? There's nothing worse than walking into a mausoleum 
of a restaurant and having it empty. Um, people like to travel year round, but there are off season. So how do you mitigate these risks from the development side and for the brand side? Um, you know, they really look to us to maximize their ADR and their revenue capacity. So, so on that phone call, do you generally have a little mini kind of elevator pitch that you give them? How does, how would the actual call go? Well, um, The nice thing about our firm is we are established. So there is a brief elevator pitch. You know, you should right off the bat, tell them what it is that, you know, you do. I always start with the why. I think that's more impactful. Why do we do design? Why are we here? Why are we in this space? Then you can tell them how you do it, how you approach design, and what are some of the design solutions you've provided for clients. And then you tell them what you do. The what you do is really what a lot of different architects do. But I think what differentiates you is that why and how. So that's how I always position our elevator pitch. So let's say you had a good initial phone call. What's the next step that you're looking to take? Be proactive. I think a lot of service providers, if you will, forget that your target client is busy. Um, So follow up and follow up frequently and keep them informed of new work that you're doing and new relationships that you build. Uh, especially you know, in these large scale hospitality projects, you have your initial client who hired you, but then they're bringing on financial partners and development partners along the way. And you might not know all the different players coming on online, but again, it's a small pool. So you know, consider every relationship is gonna come back to you at some point. We have, a destination branded residential project right now. And we've now, one of the development partners we've worked with probably three or four times, but he wasn't on board in the beginning. And we actually made the introduction, um, which is something that sets us apart is we actually try to introduce clients to other partners who will add value to the project. So part of that is in the elevator pitch is we know all these players and we can assist not just designing the architecture, but helping you build your brand identity, help you with the positioning of your project. We can introduce you to the appropriate brand for this. And if, you know, debt financing is something that's needed for this project, we also know these different equity partners and how to negotiate those contracts with them sets us apart. Okay. So you talked about following up over time, staying in touch, letting them know what your firm's doing uh, let them know you're aware of what they're doing. Just in terms of that one, let's say that first cold outreach contact phone call, what is the, uh, is there an ask there from your side? Is there something that you're asking for? Is it just sort of a get to know you call? Tell me about that. I don't think the get to know you calls are that informative um, and everyone does them. My ask is for an in-person meeting. You know, if you have a Zoom call, it's great. I told you what we do. You told us what you do. And then you send an email of, hey, I'd love to work together. If that's it, um, there's a lot of other design firms that are thirstier than you are. Um, I usually, if I do a cold call email, um, you know, I'm asking for an in-person meeting. And then I, and then you go to them. Um, if that's, if they're not in your city and if that, if it's a project that you want or a client you want to work with. And if you are in the room with the client and you walk them through a brief presentation that shows, you know, kind of the top five projects that speak to their portfolio and also go over a case study of a real project you have on the boards and real opportunities and constraints that you are going through with a client. And then you make yourself physically available um, then you'll get that client and you'll close that deal and you'll build a long-term relationship because what people want out of their partners is communication. So we talked about, this is very tactical. I was kind of getting that out of you, Ariana. Let's jump back in the more strategic sense of marketing business development. What are you seeing as the foundation for having a really effective business development program? Well, Good business development allows a firm to profit by doing something that is tangential to their core mission. Sometimes the profit is so good it becomes part of the core mission. Other times it supports the brand and sometimes just makes money. Um, But I tell people that, you know, you need to 
really examine um, where you can be positioned in the market. There's kind of two ways you can look at business development and your resources. You can spend your time and your money looking for new projects and new leads. Um, but if you only focus on that one part of your core business, it might not occur to you to consider partnerships, licensing, publishing, uh, mergers, or other profitable arrangements. Um, for a long time, we looked solely at architecture as our core business. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, we launched what we call creative services. We actually offer brand and marketing uh, services to clients. Uh, you know, we're going through the design charrettes and the workshops and all that helps inform the architecture. Why not assist them with creating their brand messaging? So we have staffed in-house um, very talented graphic designers, storytellers, videographers. We actually help clients create um, branded lease and sales collateral, videography, virtual reality, um, anything that they can do to help position their project. If it's a luxury condo, we help create all the sales collateral and those initial videos so they can actually help pre-sale their units while we're building it. We help um, mixed use centers get their, their uh, sales and leasing strategies in place so they can actually, while they're building it, they can go to a conference such as ICSC Recon and actually secure tenants. You know, you never want to be a shopping center that's open and has no tenants. Um, so we do everything with that. We, we have our own in-house virtual reality service. And that really helps move the meter with uh, the branded hospitality projects. It's all about storytelling and the experiences that you service. We'll provide. I know that you've, you've pushed video. You guys do a great job doing video. What are you seeing there in terms of virtual reality video? How is that affecting the, the landscape for marketing and presenting architecture? I think media-based marketing is the norm now. Um, you know, print collateral is fine, imagery is fine, but everything's becoming gamified. So you need to provide, you know, people want to see thought leadership on camera. They don't want to just see an animation. They want to see people talking about exactly what you were, we were discussing with those sort of cold call, you know, first pitches. Um, they want to see your face. They want to see a tour of your office. Um, you know, for a lifestyle video for a hotel, a lot of these videos have nothing to do with architecture. You know, Rosewood has phenomenal videos, but little do you see an actual building. It's about the lifestyle, how you're going to feel when you're there, what kind of experiences are you going to take home, and how are you going to translate that to friends and family? And I think that's changing. Um, same thing with virtual reality. People want to see, feel, touch the space. Um, it's becoming much more experientially driven, much more animated. Um, and this is kind of, it's not a trend. This is just the way that the industry is progressing. The Rosewood videos, are those online where we could post those and let our subscribers see those? Mm -hmm. Can you send me that link? We'll include that in the show notes. Okay. Ariana, awesome. So let's, let's talk a bit about the PR now. You also, uh, you also are involved in overseeing the PR efforts what goes into a successful public relations plan? Well, publicity is the act of getting ink. It's getting unpaid media to pay attention, write you up, point to you, run a picture, make a commotion. Um, sometimes publicity is helpful. Um, good publicity is always good for your brand, um, but it's not PR. PR is the strategic crafting of your story. It's the examination of your tactics, your services, your interactions in the world. And this determines how people are going to talk about you. In my experience, uh, a few people have publicity problems, but almost everyone has PR problems. And this is something you need to work through first. And part of this is just the story. I think everyone knows what they do, but I think when you actually start to ask leadership teams why you do it and how you do it, that's where the message sort of falls apart. And that's really what clients are thirsty to hear. And they want to understand that. Um, when we go to these first client meetings, you know, they want to understand your vision. Like, how do you approach these designs? Um, you know, if, if you look at uh, a lot of the mission statements on architects' websites, they say we're a global architecture firm and we do these kind of projects and hire us. And 
that's really not compelling. And it doesn't tell me why you're different from any of the other 10 websites I just went on. So that's, you know, business development is really defining what you want to do and how you need to do it. Um, you know, be true to your fee. Overhead's a real concern for mid and large size businesses. Um, so decide what you're going after and what you're not. Create supporting marketing collateral for that. And PR is your public voice. So you made a differentiation between uh, publicity and PR crafting the story, public relations. And you said that uh, you see a lot of mistakes or missed opportunities in terms of the public relations. Walk us through that a little bit more. What does it look like when uh, the firm is telling a story or being differentiated from their competitors in the marketplace? We, I notice a, a trend. It's easy to call you know, Biz Now or Architectural Digest or Wall Street Journal and say, hey, we have this new hotel. We have this new mall. Will you write a story? And they go, sure, great. And you have a 15-minute call. And then all of a sudden, there's a story. And you read it and going, that's not our firm at all. And that's not even how you spell my name. Um, and, you know, you put my rendering against someone else's firm name. So our strategy has really been to build relationships with editors. They need copy and they need a lot. The churn in PR, especially with the advent of digital marketing is high. So what they do is they send me the questions and we write the answers. That way you can really tell the story of who your firm is, who is the team involved, what is everyone's role, why your approach to design is different. It takes a lot more time. But it's a lot easier to do that than it is to have a misprint or just a blurb in a magazine. Um, you know, we're architects, we're in the business of building, but we're also in the business of branding and placemaking. Um, we tell stories and create experience and we design to create mean meaningful human experiences, experiences with emotion, purpose. Um, these experiences change the way people think, feel, and play in our spaces. And I think that's very hard on short 15 minute calls or quick interviews of send me some images and a tear sheet on a project. Um, you need a lot more background to tell people why your business has been doing what they've been doing for 60 years. And I'm intrigued to be working in a place where architecture is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, we factor in branding, communications, the digital technology, um, to create a more compelling and intriguing proposition for clients. And when you talk about that more compelling co uh, proposition, are you referring to the the added value services of branding, uh, creating the sales collateral, all of that, or is it something else? No, that, that plays into it. I mean, really, cr placemaking is what's moving the meter for our clients. You know, brands are evolving um, to better compete. And especially with all the mergers and acquisitions and new brands, some of these major brands need to retarget who their consumer is. Um, you see a lot more retail brands and F and B brands entering the hotel space, you know, kind of the days of just Ritz Carlton and four seasons being the ultra luxury are over. You see brands like six senses emerging and Amon. Um, so how do you differentiate your brand and compete? Um, what we saw as kind of an outcrop of the Starwood merger is this kind of redefining of luxury. And so as brands are rethinking how to compete in this new space, we need to assist them with their stories. You can build a building, a hotel tower, but if you don't really think about how the landscaping, the interiors, the placemaking, how you're moving people space to space, and then the story that you tell about the hotel, it's just going to be another structure. Um, and I think, I think the discerning traveler is looking for more, whether it be a hotel or a shopping center. You, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, malls being demolished now. We're rebuilding them as lifestyle centers. It's not about shopping anymore. It's about what you do while you're there, the entertainment component, the restaurant component. Um, retail is just one part of it. Um, and so I think clients look to us to help them understand 
this synergy of well-programmed spaces with the story of placemaking. What would you say has been your biggest challenge in terms of marketing and uh, developing business in the architecture industry? I think it's a, it's slow to evolve. You know, architects are very good at architecture, but very few of them have any experience in marketing and public relations. Um, it's hard when you're, you're profitable to change the ways of a firm. It's hard when you're successful in one domain, such as design, to change anything that you're doing. Um, but architecture is just the building. You know, you can create spaces, you can tell people why the program needs to be retooled another way. Um, but when people are looking for more, I think marketing is less scientific in many ways. You have to be flexible. You know, when you submit your permit set and you're going into a t entitlements, you know, there's, it's very scientific and very logistical on how you put together a building. Marketing, you have a plan, you have your strategy, you have your tactics, and then in six months, a brand goes under or it gets absorbed or something happens. You need to be able to maintain your strategy, but change your tactics. Um, and I think that's very hard for some people to pivot every six months if need be. What are the tactics that you're seeing right now that are, shall we say, cutting edge or that you're seeing that are working? So one thing I did is a full audit of all of our marketing, marketing collateral. And I noticed um, when I started, we had these very long kind of corporate internal brand videos. And in, in many minutes and in many words, they told you nothing. Um, I did an examination and went, well, you know, only about a quarter, of, only half the people that actually got any of the messaging, right? So um, our signature stamps, for example, we always had a link to a video. Great. Well, after a year, only about half the people we emailed even clicked on the video link. And of that, only probably a quarter of them even finished the video. So from kind of mining through all this data for different things and our digital marketing and our print collateral, I realized our videos are too long. They need to be 60 seconds. What's the point of making something someone's never gonna finish? And they need to be more compelling. In the first 20 seconds, you need to tell people exactly why they should be watching it. You know, they're not gonna wait a minute in and go, well, this is nice. This is pretty, the music sounds good. You know, people have a very short attention span. You need to tell them why they're there and why it's important to them quickly. And you need to, it needs to be context appropriate. Um, you know, people like kind of going back to the gamification. They like to be entertained. They don't wanna to have to seek the entertainment. So I think people need to rethink um, the imagery that they used. Um, you can have a great project no low resolution imagery. You need to get rid of any imagery, photography, renderings that are not um, compelling to a non-architectural audience. I think that's the big difference is mm, a lot of architects market to other architects and not the consumer world. So we actually have been going through our renderings now for very interesting projects, but they weren't market ready renderings. Um, so now we've actually worked with new renderers and we have very captivating, um, vibrant renderings for our mixed use sector. And we're doing the same thing with our hospitality. But you always have to remember who your target audience is. I'm not looking for an architect to hire me. I'm looking for a developer or I'm looking for someone who's not in real estate, but they, they are working in the real estate sphere. You know, we see a lot of tech money that wants to invest in real estate. So you need to speak to them on their level. And for you, when you talk about the renderings, what does that look like speaking to those different groups on their level? How do those, how do those if you were to describe those uh, for our listeners, since they can't see them, unless they're watching the YouTube video, of course, what would, um, what would the differences be in those kind of renderings? Well, if you're taking a, a mixed use project, for example, we have a project in Omaha right now, and it'll be about a $1.9 billion mixed use redevelopment as a lifestyle center. 
Um, on one end, it's anchored in sort of a retail power center. And as you move through, you get into more of the lifestyle pedestrian scape. And then on the other end is um, residential. But if you're taking a mixed use project, for example, and you have renderings, it's not about the architecture only. That's great, but it's about the lifestyle. People need to see uh, a person in the rendering and go, well, that could be me. So you, the lighting that you use, the people that you place, um, they matter. People need to visualize it's like an aerial photograph of the place. Once it comes online, people need to look at it and go, wow, I wish I was there. Um, it's amazing to see photography of restaurants and hotel lobbies with no people. They're bare and they're stark. And I've never, if I saw a restaurant like that in real life, I'd never eat there. It'd be strange to walk into a huge restaurant with no people. So when we're curating our photography, we do lower light. We make sure there's people at the bar, people are engaged, people are smiling. You know, we're, we're very cautious about the people that we put in our renderings. Again, it's, you're telling the story um, about why someone wants to be there, why should, you should travel there. Then you show the worst representation of the project. So again, you can have your, your renderings and your photography for a developer. You can have them for uh, an editor. You, know, certain ed you have to know your audience and who you're creating collateral for. Awesome. What haven't we talked about in terms of what you're doing now, Ariana, that you think you're excited about or you think that we should be talking about? I'm excited about launching this creative services and really helping our clients uh, craft and execute on a brand positioning strategy for each of their assets. You know, it's, it's great to work with them in that sort of pre-development feasibility stage where a lot of times we're in there helping them introduce, be introduced to brand partners, development partners. Um, you know, we're helping them move the project into a phase where we can do the architecture, but then helping them bring that project to market in both the literal sense and the built form but also in the story, um, helping them craft their press releases, um, their collateral, the videos. It's great to see a project video online. Um, we've created um, videos for clients to show planning departments so they can get approval for a project. We've seen it on you know, the client's website so they can actually sell a product. But for us, carrying the vision from the beginning all the way through the end is important to us. And we're excited. Um, Sometimes we work with brand partners that clients bring on, but we very much like to be part of the entire nuts to bolts process. All right. Well, thank you, Ariane. It's been fantastic uh, having you back here on the business of architecture. Of course. Thank you. And that is a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to register for a free online training on how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk. To discover how to market your firm to win better projects and clients, you can sign up for my upcoming design firm marketing training at architectwebinar.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.